Cause I gave you everything you wanted more You stole the key when I opened the door Make yourself at home, girl, it's all yours Make yourself at home, girl, it's all yours Who are you to bend it on me? Back on the Stephen Sully study, I'm joined with my two guests founders of Unit London, Joe and uh, Johnny. Thank you very much for coming on, on board my podcast. I'm really humbled and grateful that you, you, you said yes after a long time badgering you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so to give you a bit of uh, backstory to my podcast, I've, I've got a big passion for you know business, mm. um, pushing myself wellness and uh, sports and, and competing. Mm. And I've heard about your story. I've, I've come to your space countless times and I've been really, really impressed with what I've seen. And people only talk about good things about you. So I thought, you know what? I need to get these passionate guys on the podcast and talk about mm. their journey and talk about any kind of like uh, tips they've got for the younger demographic, talk about challenges, talk about any kind of advice that, that can motivate people. Mm. So um, were you always business partners, always friends? What, what's, the, what's the backstory there? Uh, yeah, we haven't always been business partners, but we've always been like very close friends. Right. Um, so we, we've known each other since we were 11 years old at school and <clears throat> yeah, we became best mates through secondary school and we've always had similar passions and tastes and we were always like really into art. Um, I think we started a band together in the very early days. Um, I can see yeah. that. You know? Yeah, I can see well, that. You got that. Yeah. You got that. <laughs> nearly took off. It nearally, it nearly took, took off. off. You got that right. X factor. It yeah. was the venues, the issues with venues. Yeah, exactly. It's, just, yeah. it's how it is. Um, and yeah, no, we we I think we were always very inspired by the same kind of thing, especially in art and in in, in the art classroom. Um, and I think through our friendship, we always really wanted, or we loved the idea of going into business together because we were. Clearly, both very ambitious people. Right. We had similar interests. Uh, we were both very hard working at school, um, <clears throat> and I think uh, as we went on through our teens, we were just kind of we, we always had the idea that we wanted to go into business together, but we never necessarily knew that it was going to be what you see now, which is right. an art gallery. Um, but yeah, I mean, we actually after school we went to separate universities. Um, so I went to Warwick and I did English and theatre. Okay. Um, Joe went to Manchester and did psychology. So we had a time apart for a few years. Yeah. And Joe went travelling and I stayed here in London. I went to art school. But we always maintained contact and there was always kind of um, a continuation of that conversation of wanting to do something eventually or, or a dream, a pipe dream of always going into business together. But we, we didn't necessarily know what it was. Okay. Um, and then obviously we came back after uni and we had the idea to basically start something finally because we had so much pent up energy um, and everyone else was kind of going off and doing the typical nine to five and we just had so much passion and energy to start something for ourselves yeah. <laughs> um, which was where sort of um, was the genesis of our first pop up in West London that was kind of the genesis of Unit London Okay, um, was it first called Unit London? It's called The Unit <coughs> London okay. first so well, I mean we actually went through probably like 100 names, like not exaggerating, it's probably about 100 names. And we're very particular with minor details. And that's, I think that's been a big um, feature of Unit London, the gallery is like our just exacting attention to detail. We do stress over the small things. Um, but it initially was the Unit London. And that was a nod to the fact that when we started, we wanted it to be like a unit and a united collection uh, collection of basically artists for other artists. Yeah. But also a nod to our first space, which was basically an old unit um, on, a, on a side street in, in Turnham Green in Chiswick. Mm. Um, and yeah, and the, and the aim for the gallery was really to unite artists, collectors, enthusiasts um, across all different um, stages of collecting, all different interest levels, all different ages, demographics. We wanted to really um, break down the barriers that you often find um, in people's way when they want to get into the art world. Yeah, the art world's very good at sticking those barriers up and preserving this this kind of perception of um, um, elevated social status or um, 
this mystique basically that they create and and that really alienates a lot of people from getting involved but so lots of people I think who, it intimidates a lot of people yeah I mean so I've, I've, I've walked into galleries in Chelsea before this mm. was years and years ago before me and my mm. business partner started started our business mm. and we had a not me it was actually towards my business partner a bit of a shady comment Mm. Uh, about mm. a piece of work that he was just inquiring about. It was an Andy Warhol piece at the time. Just asking about it. And yeah. the guy made a silly comment and said, oh, can't you afford it or something? Mm. And I'm thinking, what a wanker. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> they're mad, they're mad. And you're allowed to swear on this, by the way. I can, yeah. um, thinking, why would, why would someone say something like that? Yeah. Like, judge yeah. someone. And yeah. it gives the art world a little bit, certainly mm. in London, a bit of a bad rap. It, do, it does. You know? And it's not warming at all. So with you guys, when I come in here, it's polite guys, got a lot of energy mm. even you know, like when you when i meet your staff members it's so buzzing yeah. and that's yeah. a good sign of a good company or yeah. good brand yeah yeah, yeah. so it's, it's about creating that culture that's almost almost goes out of its way it kind of uh, overcompensates to be welcoming and friendly and and including because it's something that you just don't find typically walking into a gallery it is yeah. even us like when we start the business even now like with our experience in the industry we'll still walk into galleries or walk into fairs and we'll feel uh, uncomfortable, yeah. or, you know, treading on eggshells that we, we we don't belong there, or we just kind of want to get out as quickly as possible. Mm. But for us, it's it's really about trying to create an environment that's really welcoming <laughs> and friendly, and and somewhere that you want to be and actually engage in conversation. And so the best feedback <clears throat> we ever get is that it's it's that I f it's like you know I, the, the energy feels good. I feel um, people want to talk to me, and it's like it's so alien to them. Yeah, you know, it's it's such an alien experience to people. But mm. that's ultimately why we set out. In, in the very first place. So that is like the best, most rewarding feedback we can get. I think there's like a new wave of uh, collector coming through and a new wave of entrepreneur coming through. And I think it's disrupting mm. the traditional art market. And mm. I think mm. the older generation, not all, I'm not gonna tarnish everyone with the same brush, excuse that, uh, <laughs> using that pun. But um, yeah, it's just, I think sometimes they feel a bit threatened. Yeah, you know, for sure. They feel a bit threatened with the new entrepreneur and they feel a bit threatened with the way things are being done now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but well, yeah. I think back, like, if you look back to the early, the very earliest examples, like recorded examples of galleries, 17th, 18th century, the salon type of gallery, all of the depictions and stories of those galleries were buzzing. The, the atmosphere was buzzing and there, there were people there. They were always full, they were full of life. Um, and, and when you compare that to kind of the current <laughs> state of galleries, galleries in the 21st century, especially the mega galleries, it's completely different because you walk in and it's completely silent. You can hear a pin drop. Mm -hmm. It's very bright lights. It's, um, you know, you feel quite vulnerable when you're in an open space like that when no one's speaking. And we constantly, as, as John said, you know, we still go to galleries and you walk into that type of space and you feel like, a, like on edge. It's like a museum feel. Yeah, but yeah. it's kind of designed to, it's kind of, if you go to most museums, if you go to the Tate, there's people around, people are chatting, there's a buzz around the place. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people feel comfortable to, to conversate in those spaces. Mm. Whereas if you walk into a big commercial gallery, and this was our big problem when we started, you push open this big heavy door, it's suddenly silent, suddenly like you're being qualified by the person behind the desk, are they gonna buy, are they not gonna buy? Do, do we spend our time speaking to them or are they not worth our time? And then you walk around the space with a press release in your hand, dead silence, you feel like if you cough or breathe too loudly, someone's gonna judge you. Yeah. And, mm. and it's like, well, why? And, and what's also interesting is, you know, when you, if you have the, the kind of privilege of going to an artist studio and you see artists working firsthand, if you compare that experience to the modern gallery experience, also totally different. The artist comes in and welcome you, give you a cup of tea, you have a very kind of jovial chat, um, there's music playing, they're moving the artworks around with their hands, like you would never ever see them move like that in a gallery, right? No yeah. one ever kind of picks up yeah, paintings yeah. and leans them on things in an art gallery. So, um, so really what we wanted to try and do was kind of dissolve that mystique and um, make, make the whole experience of coming to a gallery, um, speaking with a gallery, um, following a gallery, just more human, ultimately. That's what, that's what we've set out to do. Yeah. And so, so the name Unit London, the reason we ultimately decided <coughs> on that name was because when you say Unit, the first thing you say is you. Yeah. Phonetically, you know, it's, you're saying you straight away. So even phonetically, in our, in our brand name, we're engaging people. Mm. Um, and that's always been so important, essentially putting you at the heart of 
what we do. That's yeah. that's our entire kind of ecosystem. It reminds me a little bit of Apple with iTunes, and mm. I, I don't know if anyone's ever given you a similar sort of thing to that. And your text is very very clean. I'm not saying that you've tried to copy that. I'm just saying it. <laughs> it reminds me of that professional clean mm. feel about your brand. Mm. So before you started your brand, did you did you actually study art, or did you? Just had a passion in it, or that was we, it? we've both been artists. Oh, you so, have? Yeah, so so we've always painters? been artists. Yeah, painters. Mm. Wow. We've always been into the same. Uh, you know, we've always kind of idolised the same painters and old masters, and um, yeah. So so I guess that's our USP, I suppose. Really. Yeah, I think you're really artists. Yeah. Yeah, because you know we're not just box tickers. We're not dealers who are just kind of looking to make a profit or trade artworks like they're stocks. That's not what it is. It's all we've always led with a passion for art, fundamentally, not trying to make money because. Truthfully, like when we started the business, we, it wasn't about making money. We had no idea what we were doing, how to even run a business, let alone an art gallery. It was literally, we were literally just doing it for ourselves. You know, we, we'd been trying to get our work into galleries in the past and we put a few of our own paintings in that first space and that was enough. That made us happy. Mm -hmm. The fact that we were doing something for mm -hmm. ourselves and we were just passionate about, oh my God, like we've actually got a, our own gallery to show our own work. We never thought we'd be hit here where we are now. It was like, it was a one month pop up in that shop. And, and that was just a buzz enough. That was like, we, we were just living. It was like mm -hmm. we were doing something for ourselves and giving us that platform because we'd never had it before and you know, getting turned away by the galleries. Um, but I think in the long-term development of the business, it has been a USP because it's allowed us, when, when we, we lead with educating people and I think people can tell that when we're speaking about the artist's work with such passion, they can tell that we're artists. The way that we talk about the technique, the way that we talk about the process, um, yeah. And I think it also allows us to forge really healthy and deep relationships with the artists as well because yeah. we've been there, like we know what it's like. Yeah. Not necessarily to their level, of course, because yeah. you know we're young and you know we just practice as artists. But I think to have both, to have the business acumen and know what it's like to be an artist to a certain extent, mm -hmm. has been our USP, and I think it continues to be our USP mm -hmm. like every single day. Yeah, you know? and it's, it's, it's that's followed through the. <clears throat> everything from the design of the gallery to the way we market our shows mm. everything that we do is very creative because we're creative people fundamentally we're not sales people we never have been and mm. um, but we're passionate about our artists yeah. and um, and yeah even like when we curate the shows that's very considered we, that's the part that we love the most because we actually get mm. to be creative yeah. working directly with artists again you're just you're immersing yourselves in in something which is inherently creative. We design the spaces, we market the shows, we come up with the, the, the campaigns for all the exhibitions and all those things, like the different ways of storytelling and expressing ourselves creatively. Yeah. Um, and when that doesn't happen, things don't go well. You know, if we're not allowed to do that stuff or if we get bogged down with the day-to-day -day business, admin side of things, which can happen so regularly, it's mm. such a pitfall, yeah. especially as you're growing fast. Um, as soon as that happens, you just find, A, we get stressed and anxious and then we'll, we'll only realize a couple of weeks later why. It's because yeah. we're not doing the stuff that we started doing yeah. or yeah. we set out to do. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, the sales and just generally the gallery and the environment uh, kind of suffers yeah. as a result of it. Yeah. So, so we always, we find ourselves having to like recalibrate every month or so and just like remember what we set out to do yeah. and why we're doing this. And, yeah. and, that, and the, the more we focus on the creative aspects of the job and, and understand and appreciate the importance of that, um, those aspects as part of our roles within the gallery, yeah, um, the better we do. Hmm. Was, was, I'm sort of jumping here because I would normally ask this towards the end, but so you just mentioned about wh why you're doing this, hmm. why are you doing it? Because you're you're doing some phenomenal stuff, but where is the end game? You know, if you're talking about, maybe I'm asking the wrong wrong hmm. wrong question now, but as purely business, right? Hmm. A business person usually looks at something, and thinks, right, here's my exit. Yeah, or yeah. here's my potential exit. Have you got that in your mind? Or is it just an ongoing evolution of your journey is gonna unfold into, it's gonna dovetail basically and go into different things like you have with your um, events. The uh, events, I mean, yeah, yeah we, we have like organically as we've grown, we've got like our ideas have expanded, but we never set out. We never, like when we started, we never set out for it to be a business. We, we didn't realize it was gonna be a business necessarily. We were just happy mm -hmm. doing an exhibition, doing a show, making it something that we'd be really proud of. We didn't really expect to sell anything. And we were selling works up to maybe, I think like 1,500 pounds was the most expensive work mm. that we had. And we, at the time we were like, 
who's going to buy a 1500 pound piece of art like that's so much money yeah how are we going to sell that and so and and so we weren't putting our eggs in the basket of sales and an exit and a business we were in the back of our minds we had the ambition for it to be something amazing but we never knew how that was going to play out because we never started a business before we'd never done that kind of stuff we never really sold anything before yeah um so so we've never thought of that and it's just really been fueled by a passion to just develop the artist that we're working with to build a brand that stood for something yeah um, and ultimately to make a change in the industry. Like when we set out, it was how do we solve the problem of elitism within the art industry? And that's still what drives us today. So that's the why, really. Okay. It's, it's to, to, um, to bring back a humanity to the art world, to champion artists regardless of their status, and to make people feel welcome. Mm. That's um, your mission statement. To do, I think to just democratize art yeah. in, like, in, in the most simplest terms, because mm your experience our experience of walking into a gallery and feeling uncomfortable for us that's literally like just bullshit it's nonsense it's like everyone has it's, it's it's a fundamentally human experience to enjoy yeah. art you know like why should that be reserved for the select few it's like for us we're so driven by making people well a democratizing art and making it accessible to the widest possible audience which we do obviously through instagram we have a big following there whatever but 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 just making the space accessible to anyone and everyone as many people you know as will sort of engage with it and connect with it um that's what drives us every day and that's what's so exciting when we get that feedback because that's why we do it it's, yeah. it's to make people feel comfortable it's to make people feel part of our community whether that's online or offline um and when the two kind of sync up together that's kind of like that's dynamite for us that's just mm. the best feeling in the world mm. as entrepreneurs business people uh, quite naturally like you can have a vision for the future and yeah. also certain goals so yeah. you're going to have your monthly goals targets yeah. <coughs> yearly goals etc yeah where do you actually see you and the brand in the next five years from now and maybe 10 years mm. after that well we've, we've put a big focus on to education that's I love, a I really love that's that. a big yeah. thing for us because ultimately that's how that that um, ambition that vision of, of trying to make things more human and more accessible the like educating people is basically like how you execute that vision yeah um, so that's a big thing for us education and you can take that forward into really interesting um, yeah. places so first I mean first and foremost we have a duty to all of our artists to ensure that they're growing and developing and this is one of the big things this is kind of one of the big um, almost ironies of what we're doing is because Building a business to be open to everyone and to democratize it um, is one thing, but obviously at the same time, we have a duty to keep developing our artist markets and make sure that they're selling for higher prices, that they're comfortable and they're looked after, take away their financial pressures so that they can create freely and develop. <coughs> and as the price points get higher, suddenly you're kind of alienating the, um, the people who don't have the money, the means to buy at that level. Yeah, um, take it to that next bracket. All of the people that supported that artist from day one. Yeah, you know, and yeah. so and so <clears throat> so so. What's important for us is that's why this like making the space basically we're open seven days a week. The door's always open. It's an automatic door. So as you walk past, it will just open. <laughs> so like, and, and we're always trying to get people in. There's people, friendly people at the front desk, like all that stuff. Um, but but educating starts at that point when people walk through the front door. It's a case of the guy behind the front desk. Mm. Um, getting up um, and engaging with those people regardless of whether they can buy or not because ultimately as we always say to our sales team you never know even if they're not going to buy they might know somebody who might buy something yeah. they might um, they might have an interesting contact that yeah. comes into the gallery that can help develop an artist in another way um, and, and the sale is not always in, I know it's going to sound a bit cheesy but like it's not always about a financial gain if mm. you make someone feel good yeah. you've sold to them in a way yeah. they're going to go off and go you know what I had a really good experience yeah. there you should go and visit it right and then two or three people down the line, right. they end up buying because they feel good. Yeah. Feel right, good feel. right. And that's the big change now in, in the age that we live in is yeah. the value in um, like ambassadors. Yeah. That they're not necessarily going to buy something, but they might share their experience with other people. And today, volume equals success, yeah. really. We, we live in a world where like the more followers you have, the more 
um, ambassadors you have, the greater your network, the greater potential you have to develop. Mm. And and that, I don't think that's been the. Ca- I mean, before social media, that wasn't really the case. Yeah. That's why the art world was just focusing on a few very <clears throat> wealthy elite collectors, and they had very small, insular, closed off events and stuff. Yeah. Whereas we're doing basically the polar opposite to that. Yeah. We're going. We're going to put our value it's like in the Illuminati in volume. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a strange industry, man. Yeah. Especially at that very top level, it's yeah. strange. But. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're opening our doors as much as possible and then bringing people through the, the cycle. So obviously we have a more exclusive um, uh, kind of experience for certain types of people and collectors. They know we're in it. Mm-hmm. We'll leave it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, but it's really, it's really kind of just yeah, opening the doors as much as possible and, and mm. um, getting people into the gallery, whether they buy something, whether they share the experience, whether yeah. they tell all their friends about it. Um, oh God, what is. you said about um, education, I have interviewed, uh, I think, three or four different artists now. And I... <laughs> <laughs> with that there you are. So um, sit. To... Sit on, let's go. So, like, to rely on... That's a wonderful piece of work. But yeah. I think your desire to buy it or your de- desire to collect it goes up as soon as you get educated by the uh, backstory of the artist totally. and the reason why and in a weird way so I, I, I don't know if it's just me being weird but I like to buy into artists who are quite controversial their backgrounds because for some mm. reason it, it's I, I well, it see, adds depth, it adds I, I, depth. I feel yeah. that sort of pain and, and the um, adversity they've gone through and I kind of want to buy their art because it, of that it adds depth I mean it's funny because Ryan certainly has that backstory without going into details but I almost think you don't need to know that because I, what's brilliant is that I think people feel that in yeah. his work. It just, and we don't tell anyone necessarily the details of his backstory, but, it's, but it is dark and it is fascinating and it does add so much texture to the yeah. work. Um, and that's when someone will really get emotionally invested in something yeah. as well as you know, financially. It's a bit, it's a bit like... <clears throat> A bit like George Kondo ish. Yeah, yeah feel it is to totally, it. totally. I mean, yeah. George Kondo is one of our favourite artists. Oh, as well. man, ma- amazing. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's one of our favourite artists. But it certainly does have that. I mean, that's actually a, a, an older work from a couple of years ago, which we just brought back. Um, but so the, the work has. Uh, you, you saw the show, didn't you? Yeah. The new collection, yeah. So, yeah. He, so it's become a, even more kind of rigid and. Um, Abstracted and more minimal, minimalist than that now. Yeah, it's really but that's cool. like one of his iconic pieces. So we, we just we're starting to like buy back work that we sold now as an investment for ourselves. All oh, right, okay. So that's also one of his older pieces um, in 2000. So Joe, you mentioned about yeah. you know over over the course of uh, a period of time, you might start with an artist and you might be working with them for two or three years, and then suddenly the price point jumps up. Do you, is that something that you suggest or something you, you collaborate together with the artist and say, I think we should move it up by 5 or 10%? How does that normally work with you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's usually a collaborative decision. And um, I mean, ultimately, you know, what we're trying to, to um, <clears throat> we're trying to get to the stage where we can basically inform the artist what the market is like and they can t- take a step back from that and just focus on their work. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the ultimate goal really for us and for our artists. Okay. Um, they don't have to worry about the market, they don't have to worry about sales. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to like, when it comes to a show, we have a sit down discussion and we inform them, um, let's say, uh, what, the, what the kind of demand is for the new yeah. works, um, how big the waiting list is, um, what the general feedback has been about pricing. Um, we also look at like the things that have happened over the course of that last year, let's say. Um, which collections have the work gone to? Have there been any museum shows, right. any museum collections, um, any public results, like auction results, <coughs> um, yeah. where prices have been visible? Um, yeah. And then we take all of those things into account, as well as like where we want to get to over the course of the next five, six years. Um, and then and there's generally a group of the artists. But I mean, generally speaking, we don't, we don't cr- like ramp up the prices like crazy. Yeah. I mean, someone like Ryan, the, the value's probably increased, yeah, like nearly 10 times over the last wow. five years. But that's happened very steadily and in yeah. line with um, certain events in his career that have justified those price increases, yeah. as well as like just an insane demand that has just fueled the pricing. Um, but, we're, but we're also very conscious. You know, there's lots, of, there's lots of spaces and it's very easy to very quickly ramp up an artist price. Inflated uh, price for no reason, yeah. Inflated, yeah. Just yeah. because a couple of people have bought it for yeah. 
whatever price, you know, or a couple of people are asking for works at this price. Yeah. That doesn't really justify shifting the entire market just mm. to satisfy the needs of one or two people because ultimately that's very dangerous long term for the yeah. artist. And is that sort of just both your understanding? Do you have um, mentors? Do you have a team to help you do that? Or is it basically both your decision and you just run with it? Yeah. As in with the pricing structure. And, and maybe some other major decisions that you do for the artists and, yeah, and, I mean, it, and even your, your place here. I guess it's, I mean, obviously we, we've kind of, you, you study, as we were kind of starting, you study other galleries and other bigger artists or you kind of study the trajectory of their career. I think we've, we, we know very well what not to do, which is, you know, jack up an artist's price really quickly because it's, it seems as though they've got, you know, a load of demand at one particular moment in time. And it's very temp we could have easily done that two, three yeah. years ago, but it's but that's that's not looking at the long term goal of the development of the gallery and the artist. You know, any any good artist or any good gallery has built an artist over a long considered period of time gradually. Mm. You know, I think the minute you start to jack up a price, as Joe said, like you just risk that mar- that artist market crashing, you know, as just as quickly the following year. So it's, yeah. and then you've you've basically destroyed the artist's career. Mm. So it's so fragile and you know, you could, the same is true in, in, in the auction, um, in the auction houses as well. So I, I think it's just kind of, I mean, it's something that is very considered and you know, we won't necessarily uh, increase an artist's price by more than 10% when the next show comes around. And we'll do everything we can to make sure that, um, you know, we've got the artists into good collections, we've got them good press yeah. um, to justify. There are, there are certain markers that do justify those price increases, yeah. but it, it's, it's a long-term journey, you know, mm. and, it, and it's something where it's not about making a quick buck yeah. in mm. one show. It's, it's, yeah. you, you really have to take that trajectory yeah. in the long term. Um, that's so important. Yeah. So it's, that's always our focus. I, um, I spoke off, off, off uh, recording with you guys about it, and it's sometimes a bit of a taboo subject in the art market, which is slamming something as investment grade, this is investment mm. grade art. We do know if you buy a Basquiat or Keith Haring or, yeah. something like, or someone of that ilk, you probably know in 10 years' time it's going to be worth a shit ton of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that is definitely an investment. Mm. But how do you kind of, kind of know or get a gut feeling who is going to be that next blue chip artist and who is just looks good but maybe mm. not investment grade? Do you know or is it I really... It's interesting. I mean, I think with, as Joe said earlier, like emerging art ultimately is all speculative. So, so to, for any dealer or gallery to suddenly put statistics and like this yeah. is going to be worth 11.56% and that's just nonsense because ultimately yeah. no one knows. We don't know. It's a gamble. It's a gamble. It's a like gamble. we obviously, we obviously will do everything we can and all our resource and passion and into making that happen, because that's only going to benefit everyone. But you don't know unless you are, a, a, you know, a cause or a, or a Basquiat or a George Condo. Like you don't know what's going to happen. But I think your taste is refined over time, and you do learn. I mean, our skill is that we believe we have a good eye, so we can see good talent when it comes along. I guess it's it's a combination of things. It's like if we see an emerging artist whose work has, we kind of have a visceral response to it. It's something we feel we haven't seen before. It seems like that there seems to be kind of like a, there seems to be momentum around that artist in the kind of, with, with savvy collectors in the industry. Um, it, that, that artist might have museum interest. It's getting a lot of press. Mm. That, that, there are a lot of like major factors where we'll kind of be moved to, um, to recommend them to our own collector base or, or collectors will come to us and kind of say you need to look at this artist because they're under something special yeah mm. um but yeah I, th- I think a lot of it is just trusting your instinct a lot of the time we'll just kind of we'll both see something where we we've we've learned to trust each other's instincts as well yeah so it's like if there's something i love the likelihood is like joe will love it as well and so but but equally if there's something that we both don't like but yeah. other people are saying it's great, then we'll kind of, we might stay, steer clear of it. But I think it's just trusting your instinct over time. Okay. Um, and knowing and then, each other, yeah, knowing each other. <coughs> and work. it becomes our job essentially to, you know, if we do believe in something enough, it's our job then to ensure that they do get into those higher echelons. And they're, I mean, ultimately it's a very small world and, mm-hmm. you know, at the top level of the industry, it's supported by a small number of collectors, a couple of auction houses and a few dealers. Um, they sustain that top level of the market. Um, and if, as long as you have relationships with those people and you know them, they know you, there's respect there, then you can start to um, move your artists up into those 
um, high levels of the market. Because mm. um, that, ultimately that's our job. You know, it's, it's, we see ourselves as people who develop artists. And, you know, it's easy to develop an artist to a certain stage. Someone like Ryan, for example, who we've been working with now for six years, and we've, we've taken him from well, where we all started, which is basically nowhere, to where he is now. And he gets to a certain point, let's say, where the attention is so big, um, he's being picked up by lots of big collectors, big dealers are paying attention. Um, if he was to move, you know, if, if a big gallery was to come in and say, we love this artist, can we work with this artist? If you're talking about the very, very top level, the Gagosian Zwerner type level, they can come in and just write a huge check and put it in front of the artist and say, we're gonna work with you, we're gonna ramp your prices up by this amount, we're gonna need your production to go up by this amount, and this is what you're looking at as a year's earnings, let's say. Um, it's very difficult to compete with those types of galleries. Mm. Um, you can equate it to like, you know, the Manchester United's and the, the Chelsea's and the cities of this world versus mm. the Southamptons mm. who are basically develop talent and then sell it on. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, our ambitions are to be at that very top level. Yeah. And so we're trying to grow with our artists by developing the right, right relationships with the right collectors, the institutions, the auction houses, um, so that we can retain our talent and take them to the top and we go on that journey together. And I think that's <coughs> where, again, like us being artists has such a great value because um, we can connect with our artists on, on a genuine level. Mm. Like they, our artists don't really see us as dealers necessarily. They see yeah. us as just people who are supporting them and well, like trying a, to grow with them. It, it's almost like a, like a kind of like a music uh, agency. You know, you're developing their career and you're just take, you're almost taking them on tour, giving them a bit of guidance, mm. giving them a bit of uh, mm. yeah. mentorship. Yeah. Very, very similar to that. It's very similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it definitely is. There's, there's lots of parallels. I mean, for us particularly, I think, because we <coughs> have always started, we, we always started the gallery with the idea of building content and creating content for our artists. That's been such a big thing. Um, and actually borrowing principles from film and music and applying them to the campaigns we were running for our art shows. Um, so we used to like fly around the town. We used to, um, or we still do, um, make videos, like very, very kind of snackable videos, mm. which go out on social and then go on the website, um, which really tell the story of the artist and they're shot in a very dramatic and theatrical way yeah. to engage people at our level. Because again, <clears> you know, the, Big galleries in the art world generally has kind of formulated this language which is very alienating in its nature. Mm. Um, but we live in an age now where people want visual content um, and we understand what people are consuming and, and the way people communicate and behave. And so we've made content that actually is going to stimulate and engage a younger audience. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how, how we've marketed the gallery up until this point. Um, really telling the stories of the artists in novel ways that the industry hasn't done before. Yeah. The art industry specifically, music and film have been doing that for you know, the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, mm. But the art world hasn't, and we always thought that was kind of weird. It's like, why, why do you have a musician on the front of uh, like a GQ or a Vanity Fair and not a visual artist? Yeah. Um, there's only a very, very few visual artists that have ever made it to that status. Mm. Um, but we've always thought that and I guess one of our big goals is to, is to make art a more mainstream part of culture. Mm. Um, rather than growing up and feeling like you can't get into the industry, yeah. we want kind of the younger generation to be growing up going, oh, I, like, I follow these 10 artists and I'm so yeah. passionate about them and I just went to this show and they're showing in this place in two weeks, they're, going, they're showing in Paris, I'm gonna go and see the show. And that's really the culture that we wanna instill in people and that can only be good for, for our culture generally. Mm. The more creative and visual culture is, um, the more lateral thinking happens, the more innovation happens. It's just generally good for mm. culture and the economy. Yeah, um, that's kind of one of our our goals as well. When I first come across you guys, I think in Soho when you had your um, gallery there mm -hmm. on Wardour Street. Wardour Street. Yeah, yeah. And still um, there, by the way. That that was. A, I still have the keys to that. Really? Space. Yeah. <laughs> Is it derelict? Yeah. All oh, right. What are they doing there? Well, they kicked us out um, two years ago. To, to <laughs> I don't know why. I thought they did quite a good job. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, since then it's just been empty. But I still Weird. had the keys. I went. I was walking past it the other night. Let's do a rave there. Tonight, yeah. so. Honestly, I mean, yeah. That's, I, I have the keys. I opened the doors. 
I mean, there's no lights it in there. It could be but... unit, Steve, Sally, study, come together for yeah. one night. One, one bring, night only. We we'll bring the dog along. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll go. We'll there's go always a party. party. It's always a party. He's, he's yeah. always a party. <laughs> he's a party star. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you went from there to, to, to here and you got a space over in Covent Garden. I know you're, you're, you're creative guys, you're artists at heart, but there's a business side to you guys because mm. of, this place is not going to be cheap. Mm. So talk to me about the journey from where you started to where you are now because there there's going to be lots of good stuff, but what about some of the challenges that people can learn from? Yeah, I mean, there's been plenty of them. Uh, I mean, we, first and foremost, uh, we've, we've never had any funding, no investment. Um, even up until this point? Even up until this point. We've got plenty of offers, which is really flattering. So it's all bootstrapped kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and that's probably what we're about to get into. Yeah, um, lots of like uh, DIY stuff. I mean, now like we're, now we're in a position. Obviously, we're in. We've got this gallery, and we've got a great team of about twenty people now in the team who are taking care of like different departments and different things. But yeah. back in the day, obviously, obviously, it was just the two of us. Often with spaces that were way too big for two people. Um, and uh, yeah, there's been lots of you know. Even logistics, art wrapping, art handling was done by us without gloves, without mm. without a van. Um, so uh, yeah, there's been lots of like bootstrapping situations, yeah, for sure. Um, but as we was, we said, we we're saying this the other day. I mean, that's really put us in such a great position now because now that we do have a team and things are being looked after, we, you know, we've done that. We've we've wrapped the works ourselves. We mm. paint the walls. We've been up at four o'clock in the morning trying to hang a space on our own. So we understand every aspect of the business in, like implicitly. And I think that's such value for a business owner when yeah. you know, when you've done every single job on the way up. Um, and now that we have people looking after them, there's, there's no room for them to slack because we yeah. understand what their role should be and we yeah. know how the functions of, that, of those roles and how they need to be done. There's no excuses basically for the team because we know we've done it ourselves. Yeah, yeah. That's a big value add for us. That's, um, yeah, and I think a lot of, I mean, generalizing for sure, but um, lots of, gallery owners who've maybe grown up in the industry, um, they start with a certain level of capital, let's say. And so they, they get a space, they get a team in to, to do everything. And then they don't have an understanding or necessarily they don't appreciate the value yeah. of all of those jobs that people are doing for them. Yeah. Um, so it's, that's a big thing for us, I think. Mm. Um, I think, I think uh, we've been very nomadic, basically. You know, we, 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 I mean, we've probably had about 15 pop-ups to get to this point. I mean, this... Like, we still pinch ourselves the fact this is a permanent space, obviously, now, you know, it's a long lease. It's amazing as well, I love it. But yeah. it, it's, it's taken us a long time to get to this point because it, before it was literally like we'd go into one space, we'd kind of seemingly feel like we were settling into a home for three, four months and then we'd mm. be booted out straight away because we didn't have the security of a lease. We weren't, we weren't, you know, we were just kind of paying peppercorn rent. We would be very kind of just... Um, you know, we, we, we'd walk around the, the streets of central London, literally for days, weeks, and just kind of be, but you know, there'd be like a little advert with the, with the agent in the window and we'd just be calling them, anyone and everyone. Like, you know, and we, nine times out of 10, we'd get kicked back and like, no, you know, sorry, it's taken or we're not, we don't want this to be an art gallery. But we were just incessant on the phones, like every day after our first space. The skill we're badgering. Badgering. It's bad, it's badgering. <laughs> badgering. And it's also it's like, it's like, yeah, like we have, no, ultimately we were, we were approaching landlords with no money. Nothing. So, and they were like, there's a space like in the West End, like in Covent Garden. And we call them up going, we haven't got any money for you, but. But you've got a dream. <laughs> literally, we're like, <laughs> that's you know, what it was. Like, we'll, turn your, we'll turn this area and this space into the, one of the most buzzing um, places in London. And that's going to be great for you and your businesses and la la la. And um, I, don't, I mean, it, it was badgering, it was hustle. Yeah. Like, it was just look, this is going to happen. Just give us a shot. Let us do it. And nine times out of 10, they said no. Like, luckily, this space in Covent Garden, it was like the right timing yeah. and the right pitch. Yeah. And we got a pitch meeting with them. We went in. We came up with this entire concept around Seven Dials and this exhibition, which is going to be the Seven Deadly Sins. And we're going to work with each of the local retailers to drive footfall to their businesses, but also um, to try and turn Seven Dials into a hub of arts and culture which I think, which we kind of knew in the back of our minds was a motivation for them. Um, and it sounded like an attractive idea to them. Obviously, we didn't really have anything at that time. So we were saying, we're gonna bring A plus clients to the area, you're gonna get celebrities. And actually we did deliver on what yeah, we actually got, yeah. yeah. Um, we did deliver on what we said we were gonna deliver on, but it was, that was how we got our foot in the door. And then, yeah, as John said, we, because we didn't have any money, they were like, well, we'll give you the space for 
a two month rolling basis, right. but with the um, ability for us to basically kick you out at between three or to six weeks notice. Um, mm. So so that's how we built the business. We just accepted that. We we're like, well, that's You had great to become because, resourceful. Well, yeah, that, was, totally. that, that, was the biggest cha- that was the biggest challenge that was constantly testing of like how much, really, like that's saying cliche, how much do you really want this? How yeah. much do you really believe in this? Because we would literally just be in one space, get kicked out, at one space, kicked out. And you know, bear in mind, we had no resources, no money to pay vans to like collect stuff and put it into storage. We didn't have a storage facility. A lot of it would just go back to our houses where we were living. When we didn't have a space, we'd be working at one of our houses or in a cafe somewhere yeah. or a hotel. So I guess it was like, that was really testing. It was like, we'd move into another space, but kind of like despondently because it was like, well, yeah, but how long are we going to be here for before we have to move and we're uprooted again? So and then it, set up time and set up and that's so disruptive to business because then it's like you know you're trying to build a collector base and it's like well how seriously are people going to take you because if otherwise people ultimately just think you're a pop-up gallery yeah you know we, we're desperate to be taken seriously and try and break into the kind of um critical art world yeah but it's like how, how do we it's so hard to do that with that permanent space and we always knew that so it was like we were constantly just trying to build to get to that point but soho was our first kind of semi-permanent space because we were there for a good year and a half and with there, we truly felt like we were, yeah, we can see this happening. Like we might be able to actually build up some capital to maybe actually be here like for, for some time. But then sure enough, after a year and a half, we got booted out. And so then we were really like, shit, what do we do now? Yeah. Like, you know, but again, it was like, I think being kicked out so many times and just finding another solution, finding another solution, that's what really builds character. I think yeah. that's what really builds your belief to bounce back from that. And, and, and that's what kind of con- con- like, continually validates your belief in what you're doing. Because now when you get to this point where we have done everything ourselves, we have uh, four tooth and nail, blood, sweat and tears to get to this point of having a permanent space, that you value that journey so much. Mm. And, and that's when you realize it is really about the journey. Yeah. There's so much more to come. Obviously we've only, only been doing this six years, um, but we really value and respect what we've had to go through. And, and we have been down and out. There have been times where it's like, you know, should we, do we really want to keep doing this? Because this is exhausting. I was like, going to ask you. We're actually, not making any money, and it's like, oh, yeah. Was there anything like one or two moments where you thought, you know what, should we just pack it in and go to that nine to five kind of job, or we're going to persevere now? It probably crossed our mind, but I think we, we've never been. I think we've always had that mentality of like failure is just not an option, and yeah. fear and yeah. fear of failure is what's probably always driven us at the deepest kind yeah. of level, yeah. and still does. Because you know how now. fragile it is. Yeah, it's like you, because being kicked out like that so regularly. Knowing that, knowing that you would need to basically come up with another solution on the spot while still trying yeah. to like maintain the perception that you're a credible gallery and everything's fine. We're not closing down. We're just having to move. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You don't know where yet, but we'll be back. On it. Oh, yeah. all the time. Always trying to put a spin Constantly. on it. Like, yeah. But, but yeah, that, there were times, of, there's been lots of times actually when it's been like, it's just all the odds have been stacked and you just think, this is fucking ridiculous now, yeah. <laughs> you know, but... It's relentless, it just keeps constant, coming at you. Just relentless, and, and, and that is how it happens. It just, you know, if one bad thing happens, then another bad thing happens, and it does test your, your belief in it. But, but at the same time, as John said, failure hasn't been an option, and I think that's always been the thing. It's like in the back of our minds, we're like, no, regardless of what's going to ha- happen, um, we're going to make this work. Yeah. And we'll find somewhere else, and we'll get another space, we'll get a bigger space, we'll get a better space. And every time something bad happened, we always tried to come back bigger and stronger. Every, every space that we had mm. after we'd been kicked out of one was a better space than the mm-hmm. one before. So it always looked like, and from the outside perspective, it always, it always looked as if we were growing. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and we were, yeah. and we still are. And, you know, and now we're here. This is obviously an incredible space, but this has now become normal. Yeah. This is now our level. And now we're thinking, What's the next step forward? Mm. You already spoke about a show over in America in Dallas, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, you're already thinking global anyway. Mm, so why definitely. not? You know, you've got, a ma- you've got the, probably one of the biggest gallery in London or Mayfair, I would say. Uh, it's one of the biggest, God, that isn't it? That sounds surreal. I think it's up there it's, in terms of size. Uh, it's, it's, it's huge, huge it's space. square footage. It is. I mean, it's still, as I said, it's still, we're still very humbled by the fact that we're here because we never genuinely thought we'd be here in six years. Yeah. This is kind of the thing where it's like, oh, maybe in 10 years, you know, we'd love to be in the, because it is the arts hub of London, mm. Mayfair. It's like, you know, but I, I think that it's probably just testament to our work ethic, I guess, and just 
our belief and, and just kind of um, being very resourceful and creative yeah. in really ad- adverse kind of situations. So, so go, you're doing a show over in America. Um, yeah. Any, anywhere else in Europe or anything else coming up for you guys? We have something in, um, well, I mean, Europe's like becoming more and more interesting, obviously, because of like the potential of like a no-deal Brexit mm. coming up. So Europe is is an important place, and we do have our eye. I mean, we're, there's a pop-up in Monaco, which we nearly did earlier in the summer, which we'll probably do before the end of the year. Um, we just did a show in LA with Philip Colbert, um, who's a British artist, to time with um, Freeze Los Angeles, which the Freeze Art Fair went to LA for the first time. Cool. So we did a show out there, which was hugely successful. I mean, we literally put that together in about two weeks. Um, and then we have Dallas at the end of this year with the Goss Michael Foundation, mm-hmm. which, which we're taking Ryan to. It's a big solo exhibition of new works from him. Um, and then we're also speaking to various different parties about um, a permanent space overseas. Um, and we're looking at Asia at the moment is the key focus for us. Um, we have lots of, lots of great clients and collectors in Asia. Okay, which, um, which part? Uh, well, actually all over, but yeah. we're looking at China for a permanent space. Um, Brilliant. So we, we actually have a couple of offers from parties out there who want to open you know, London, China. So like a franchise or? Um, it won't be a franchise. Okay. We actually did, it's funny, like we threw that term out in an interview we did a couple of years ago. And the, the interview, went, uh, it was the Business Insider interview. Yeah. And just yeah. went vi- like the interview went vi- yeah, No, No, didn't realize it was going to go as big as it did. <laughs> no, it just... It blew up. It was a random interview. The guy was recording on a dictaphone. And he was like, our age. <laughs> yeah. And then suddenly it just went. Pff. And we mentioned the word franchise in that interview. And then literally that week we had maybe 15, 20 offers from big investors globally. From Chicago to Sydney to Shanghai wanting to start up their own unit, London, in their mm. city. Um, but it's just but a franchise is a very difficult thing. When you, when you, I don't think it works with art necessarily. It works with other things mm-hmm. like FMCG and other industries, but with art, it's, it's a difficult thing to franchise because it's yeah. all about reputation, brand, perception, yeah. and those yeah. things have to be controlled. And if they have a slightly different eye to you for art and different morals everything. when it comes down to promoting them, exactly. then before you know it, Unit London isn't yeah. what, it, exactly. what it is. It's so fragile. It's such, yeah. a, fragile, it's yeah. so fragile. It's such a sensitive industry. In that well, sense. would you ever consider mm. like almost like not a split but like one of you spend some time over in Asia one of you here and then you switch yeah Anything probably like going to have to yeah inevitably yeah. yeah I mean long term the, the goal right now is to basically stabilise London so it's fully kind of established the team is you know it's a really self-sufficient running on its like a machine own. yeah yeah, yeah. And we don't have to physically be here because ultimately the way the business is going to grow long term in the way that we want it to is to travel yeah. and to, to expand overseas. And, you know, a lot of our biggest collectors and supporters, patrons are overseas, yeah. they're not from London. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but yeah, and that's, but that's always been the goal because it's, it, we see Unit London as being so international yeah. as a brand. Well, so. uh, I've always been, I, I read a lot of uh, different books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad being one of my favorites from Robert Kiyosaki. I love that book, I've read it a few times, number one and two and the other ones. And he says, uh, if you got like a brand, but you, you have to be permanently, permanently in it, it's almost mm. a glorified self, um, self-employed self job. Mm, but yeah. when you've got a business, it's a machine that runs itself. Yeah. Now, of course, you need to have a little hand in it every so yeah. often yeah. to sign off artists or the yeah. way you're going to promote it. But yeah. ultimately, a business is not a business unless it can run itself. Mm. Absolutely. So um, that's yeah. kind of yeah. the, the transition that myself and my, and my business partner are in at the moment with our business. Right, yeah. Um, I think we want to get there and obviously do more traveling mm. and then enjoy a business but also enjoy life at the same time absolutely and, yeah, you yeah. know have that have that where you're, you're balance, quite you're quite nimble with it yeah I, I, we, we, it's, it's found independence right yeah. and mm-hmm. and that's definitely what we we realized we had that because i mean a lot of our stories wound up in in us and what we've how we've got to where we've got to that's had that has been a big part of the story and i think people buy into that a lot and they respect that um but we've always tried, the reason we created Unit London with such a strong identity was it's not like, it's not like Kennedy and Burt, the art dealers, you know, because that's no, nothing like what we are. Um, it's Unit London and the whole thing is being not, not a faceless brand, but a brand which people identify with, mm. you know, not, not a sales room that people buy from. It's a brand that people believe in and buy into. Um, and, and yeah, so the founder dependence thing, we've, we're really trying to move away from. And now, so we've made a couple of big senior appointments in the team. Um, who've come in with a lot of experience, a great skill set, who can 
basically run London mm. and then and because the business isn't going to expand if we don't get out there and expand it ourselves yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the plan yeah it's, it's yeah. to stabilize here um, make sure that this place is running autonomously with a bit of guidance from us yeah and a bit of leadership but actually we can focus on the next project to really like take the brand forward yeah mm. I'm, I've got a few businesses myself and I'm continuously learning all the time I'm still fairly young in my mm. in my sort of uh, career I'm only 33 I'm not sure how old your guy, you guys are 29 okay <laughs> still under Early this year still under okay yeah, uh, so you're both same age yeah. yeah and what I didn't appreciate when I first got into business for the first time I unlike you I'm not creative but I'm from a sales background right so I always had that thing of if I don't sell I'm gonna go broke this month and it happened a few times mm. so I'm quite used to that resourcefulness where I have to yeah. suddenly find a way to, to raise some money yeah uh, but I'm really shit on the creative side. <laughs> and um, when I went into business for the first time, very gun ho I was like, right, I'm going to have business, I'm going to be this millionaire, I'm going to be really, really cool and all that kind of stuff. What I didn't realise is how many different hats you've got to wear. So like, yeah. you've got the actual business itself, being creative, yeah. selling, yeah. processes, marketing, then you've got the boring stuff like taxes and VAT yeah. and stuff. I've got my own, interp well, my own view on it, but how did you kind of discover or learn that kind of, way of business how did you like wearing this hat today this this hat now and how did you kind of learn that um i think it's i think it's just something you learn as you go as you go right? i think it's the it's kind of, of it, yeah. you get forced into a situation you where job. you're like well i've never done this before yeah. i mean selling is a great example because we've never mm. really sold before i was working in advertising and it's they're very creative pursuits they weren't sales roles yeah and so our first sale was like right how the f like just pdq machine here there's a guy who's got an intention to buy something what do we do then? It's like, obviously the, yeah. you have a natural, like you, you try and do it, but when we started our sales patter and our technique, everything was awful and it was completely unstructured. It was uneducated, all those things. But but now we're, I'd say we're probably great at sales because we've learned on the job and we've had to yeah. wear that hat so many times. Yeah. Um, but then you make the sale, then you go, right, like, how do we log that? Where's, where does that go? Like where's that data live? And then you build a spreadsheet. And like for the first two years, you're working off an Excel spreadsheet, and it, yeah. <laughs> it's just so bad. And then using up one of our own personal accounts as well. Yeah, it's going into my, my whole spark, <laughs> please. Yeah. That was weird. And we're you know making it just making invoices on Microsoft Word, and just you figure everything out. Um, yeah. And then as the team grows and develops, then it becomes you know much more of your day becomes focused on structure and ensuring that like. The cogs within your team, within your machine, essentially are all running smoothly. Make yeah. sure everyone's properly motivated and incentivized. Mm. Making sure that the people who are working for them are happy. Um, making sure that there's a structure that that fits the company culture, not just kind of an off the shelf. This is how it works. There's a manager here, and they have a line manager, and they have three people on the team. It's actually trying to find something that works for your output. Mm -hmm. um, so and that's always developing, always, always, always. Like we've never had a really rigid structure. It changes very often. It's very fluid. But mm -hmm. that's how that's good for us. That's that's um, that's a good um, structure. And I think I think the word that you used earlier, which is culture, so important yeah, to have the right winning totally. culture in it. Because when you said you're open seven days a week, mm. you tell other business owners you're going to be open seven days a week. They're going to go fuck off, mate. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I've got a shot on Friday, and I've got a shot early because it's yeah. I've got to get down the pub. Yeah. And you say that to some sales staff, and they would they would just be in shock. Yeah. But then other people cannot wait to get up and go into work. Yeah. So how do you create that 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 winning culture where everyone's so upbeat and ready to get into work? Well, yeah, I think that I think a you've obviously got to find the right people to start with. You've mm. got to are they going to be kind of um, are they going to have that disposition? You know. Do you, do they have the energy? Do they have the passion to start with? I think what you know, we try and identify people who have that hunger and ambition and passion because ultimately that's what's most important for us when we're finding people that want to work for us. You know, it's like, do they share that same kind of um, fire to, to actually achieve something and, and not just come in and, and kind of do the day to day and, and, and you know, clock off at seven, but actually they want to make a, a genuine change in the industry as we do, you know. Do they share that passion and drive? I think that's that's key. But also, you know, you know, of course, I think for us, we always say it's like they have to be trained to speak the unit London language, and that's what feeds into building that culture because it is it's not sterile. It's not just a sales driven business. It's about creating experiences for people, and if the storytelling and the experiences are are, are well crafted, 
then the sales kind of follow, you know, as we, as we said earlier. So, so it, it's so important for us to, to create an environment where people are motivated, incentivized, and always reminded of why we're doing what we're doing. Mm. Like we just did a presentation a few days ago to the staff in this room. Um, because you know the, the team's grown so substantially in quite a um, short space of time, and eighty percent of those people probably, have, uh, you know, they've they've only just started, so they don't necessarily know how we've actually got to this point. All they see is this incredible Mayfair gallery, you know, with, with, with sellout show upstairs, and, and it's it's al- it's almost unrealistic for a new member of staff to see that, especially if they're like at a junior level. So we did a presentation that kind of chronicles the journey from literally day one with us to in that first space with drills, you know, like with our parents helping out to, to, to kind of just educate them as to and remind them why we're doing what we're doing. Because then you inspire them to, to be like, oh my God, this is amazing. Mm. I understand now why they're, they're not, they're not just doing this to sell art or to like b- build artists. They're actually doing this for a genuine reason that's rooted in real principles, uh, you know, and a desire to change the industry. And that's so important to, to motivate them and get them on board with. Yeah. With those principles basically quality mm. yeah. outside of work then guys just a couple more things uh obviously i know you're open seven days a week but you must have some downtime <laughs> do you do training you've got any hobbies what else do you do yeah, yeah. i mean it's funny because like the last the last six years have been so we've been so plugged into the business and i think only really in the last year the team has been at a good enough level where we're comfortable to take a step back and so like it's really only been the last 18 months we've taken weekends off mm. um, and that downtime is so important I mean like usually you get to the end of the week and you're so tired like you're just exhausted and drained from that week that um, you just want to sleep basically yeah <laughs> you just want to like sleep and switch off um, but yeah I mean we ha- I mean I'm a big fan of football I think you are too uh, more boxing. More boxing. I, I, I don't mind football. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say I'm a Chelsea fan, You're a Chelsea but, fan. but they got destroyed yesterday, I think, by Man United. Yeah. Um, but yeah. more boxing, me. Yeah. Yeah. And you? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's the same thing. We just get to the end of the week, and it's like, you know, the weekend we'll just we'll just t- try and you never sw- you've never switched off mm. because we're almost we're always on. It's the paradox of an uh, entrepreneur, I guess. Absolutely, and especially you got, with your phone and, and you know Instagram and you social can't, media. You can't switch off, you can you? Because you're you taking. You know. I think the important thing is learning to embrace that. Yeah. Because yeah. like it's so easy to get stressed about the fact that you can't switch off. Yeah. But mm. ultimately, like if you just have to like kind of put yourself in that mindset of actually, first of all, you love doing this because we both love yeah. doing it, um, and and secondly, yeah, just just. Um, appreciate like what you have and then work for it and um, mm. I think as soon as you embrace the idea of like not being able to switch off and you don't see it as a negative yeah. um, then then you can kind of feel a bit calmer generally throughout the week rather than going like Monday to Friday you're just like up here and then weekend you crash yeah if you if you if you kind of appreciate the lifestyle of yeah. like being an entrepreneur let's say then it's much easier to go through the week at like a, at a high level but never kind of peaking and troughing yeah um, that's something that I've certainly learned. Over yeah, last, I agree. Over I think. I think. I mean, exercise. Obviously, it sounds so basic, but it's it's also so important. So it, yeah, exercise so, because, so important. because it is high stress. Yeah. What we're doing, obviously, and we as much as we love it, it you know, you, you, I, I certainly need that to just keep me leveled out. Yeah. You know, because we are always on. We're always on our phone, or there's always someone that needs something, or a, a crisis, or whatever. So it, it's it's kind of I, exactly that. I, I've learned to to really just kind of. You, you'll never be able to just completely disconnect. So don't fantasize about that. It's more just appreciating what, what we're doing because it's amazing, ultimately. Yeah. You know, it's hard work, but it's amazing and we love it and we're passionate about it. But I think, yeah, just trying to have a balanced lifestyle and just basic things like seeing friends or, you know, our, it's, our time is very limited to do that, but, or, and seeing family, you know, it's, it's that really. It's, the, ba- it's the basic. It's, it's basic. basic. I mean, it's it's like, basic. it literally is because yeah. we've sacrificed so much of not seeing friends and family to get to this point. It's almost like now that we're, our time is potentially freeing up more and more now yeah. as we grow and we have a team, it's, it's kind of going back to those things and like, yeah. you know, spending time with things that matter, I guess. But, yeah. but it's hard to do that because yeah, we are yeah. also married to the job and we love what we do. So it's very easy for us to just kind of work rather than you know, going out. Or, yeah, yeah. Heard, uh, and also no, the ambitions are, are so big still. They're actually probably bigger now than they were because yeah. now we see the potential. Yeah. yeah. When we started, it was a, it was kind of a pipe dream. Um, but now it's, you see like the, 
the way the industry is moving, you can see our position within the industry, even the fact that we're in the industry yeah. is amazing for us. Even mm. the fact that we're recognized as a gallery, a London gallery, and we're on that list now, mm. you know, even that's amazing for us. Because when we started, it was just like, imagine. Well, yeah. I remember, I don't know what show it was. It was probably, it was definitely last year, I think. And I think, how long have you been in here? A year. A year. So yeah, I think it was probably, I don't know, it might have even been an opening of, of this place. And I remember walking past, and there was a queue around it. Yeah. I, thought, I actually sort of stepped into your position for a slight moment and thought, what a lovely thing to, to feel and see. Mm, like yeah, you open yeah. up a new gallery, yeah. new spot, and you've got a queue around the building yeah. trying to get in. Yeah. yeah. I thought, what, a, what an amazing thing. I yeah. actually turned out that day with uh, Scooney. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was yeah. the, I think yeah. that was the opening. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and that's like, because it, it used to be the complete opposite of that you know it's like we'd open a space and we'd just we'd literally be outside on the street trying to drag people in yeah. to tell them about it um so it's really nice like, that like a bar in Mag- uh, magaluf or something yeah Come in honestly yeah, yeah, it's two no, for no, one. Joke. no joke two for one on artworks we had to we had no option <laughs> but and that, and, you know there were times that we would like if it was quiet we would take an artwork and put it like in the doorway so that people would see it and we could yeah. tell people about it as they were walking past it was that level you know mm. but but then you know, everything since we started, it's never been about selling art. It's always been about building a community, standing for values. And, and by the way, those values um, are taken up not just by um, the outside, but also our staff. Like when you talk about culture, those values are the reason that they're here. Like they, they also believe in those values. Mm. And they've wanted to come and work for us because they know that we stand for those things. And that's, that's ultimately what keeps them coming back. That's what makes them the work longer hours. The integrity of your morals by you guys, which are filled with down to the staff totally. members, and, they, yeah. and it resonates with them. Totally, yeah. yeah, and then they, and they take it on. And it's like we're not telling them to do things. Like they believe those things that we believe and that the company believes. And so they're happy to kind of go over and above to make sure that those things are seen through. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and the reason the queue is there is because the, the people that are queuing also believe those things. Yeah. And so they want to come and support. So it's like, we've got, we've got people really like, we've got a real community that believe in, in our values. And I, and I think that's so important for the long-term future of the business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, people don't just come because they like a certain piece of art or they think the prices are good or they think that we're working with a certain artist that's great. They actually come just because they believe in changing the industry um, in supporting artists and all of those things that we stand for, mm. which is which is great, and it's so nice for us to be in that position now, where those things are happening, mm. um, where conversations are, are going on around the gallery um, after so much like toil to get to a stage where that might happen. To be there now is really nice, mm. but obviously, still the ambitions are, are mega, yeah. and they're, they're, they get bigger and bigger all the time as we as we get more and more you successful. Get more success, yeah, feet, the feet, success, uh, oh, sorry, the, the ambition yeah. becomes even greater. Um, and I think it will probably always be that way. Yeah, yeah. realistically. That's epic. Um, so I think there's only two more things I want to ask. So if you or three. Um, so I'm hoping to ins- part of my mission for the podcast is to inspire the young demographic. I think it's so important. I'm not going to blame my school, but like as I was coming out of school, I wasn't uh, maybe fortunate enough to, to to go to university or go to higher education. It just wasn't my bag. Mm. And I actually had a few times teachers saying, you probably won't amount to nothing because you can't get very good grades and stuff. Mm. And had there been, back in the day, podcasts where I can listen to young entrepreneurs who've gone through troubles, but also had, or, or challenges, or and now have got success, I would have relished that. Mm. So is there any bit of advice that you can give to anyone who's gonna motivate them, educate them, inspire them? Mm. Just a couple of little tips to say, right, this is what you should do in order to, to start thinking about a, a brand or a, a, mm. or a company? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean for, us, for us, we got into an industry that I think maybe 20 years ago we probably wouldn't have been able to break into if this was 20 years ago. But because of the generation that we now live in, with like unbridled access to online, digital media, you know, social media, that was ultimately our gateway into into a business that traditionally we wouldn't have had any look mm. into, you know. So I think the opportunities now are just vast for for young people wanting to break into an industry, to create a, a brand or create a business, and they can do that from just building something online. Um, that's ultimately how you know we, we we had a small physical space, but we achieved so much through building an online presence and communicating our brand message and our principles. Um, And that's ultimately allowed us to build a big physical presence. 
but it's, I just think it's really interesting. We've had this conversation many times, but like 20 years ago, I don't think, I think our chances would have been extremely slim breaking into the art world. And, and it's a, such a difficult industry to break into. It's so competitive, it's contact dependent. We had no right really to break into the industry. Yeah. That, that's the truth of it. We had no contact, we don't come from the art world. We were just artists, we, we, you know, we didn't come from, um, we, had, we didn't know dealers, we didn't know journalists, nothing. So I think, I guess in a, in a word, it would be that, that, that you, can, you can really build something online I think you can, if you've got the right kind of tenacity and if you've got an idea that you should start communicating it with people online through mm. podcasts or YouTube videos or an Instagram page, whatever it is, mm. and, and, and to start creating amazing content that's, that's authentic, that's, that's kind of, um, that comes from a belief or, or, or a, you know, you're trying to create an antidote to a problem that you see in a particular industry and you want to create something new. Um, communicate that online and start making amazing content that's consistent and brand driven um, because you can long term do amazing things because I think that's what we've done we've, mm. we've tried to create a brand that's essentially lived online at the start and now it's become physicalized in, in what you see now yeah, it's like using the tools that are available to you right mm. it's like <clears throat> today you have versus 30 years ago the tools that you have available to you right now are insane like the opportunity to tell your own story to the world has never been bigger and it's never been greater like versus our parents generation and the generation before that like the opportunity is massive so it's just like take advantage of those opportunities mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and obviously marry it with yeah like marry it with hard work don't ever think that something's just going to come your way because it's not yeah. um, well it's, I mean very very rarely does, does an opportunity just land on your doorstep if you keep sticking your neck out and you keep sticking your neck out and you keep sticking your neck out, then eventually you will get somewhere. And that, I think that's, we certainly believe that. Mm. Um, the more you try, yes, you're gonna fail. You're always gonna come up against roadblocks. It's not an easy world to live in. The business world is particularly difficult. It's hard to make a name for yourself, but con like persistence and consistency is so important. Mm. And as long as you can keep kind of fighting through those challenges and um, apply real hard work and belief to, to what you're trying to achieve, then use the tools that are available to you, like basically social media, the online community, the internet. Um, it, it is possible. Mm. It is possible have to start a belief. business. Yeah. Have the belief, have the belief, absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, when you're coming, if you're kind of building a brand especially, just understand why you're doing it and make sure you're really clear on that. Like what we did when we started was we condensed our mission statement basically into one sentence, which was, we exist for you. And Unit London is come, like comes out of that, but when you've got that down written so concisely, you never waver from that core principle. And as long as you stay true to that, then you, you give yourself an identity. It's which like your north star. Understand. It's like what you're always heading towards. Right. And totally. if you and if you like, if we didn't start out going, we want to sell art, because then, because that's like a product of what we're doing. It's yeah. not. It's not the the reason why we're doing it. The reason we're doing it is to make art more human and break down those barriers. Mm. And then selling art is a function of that. So it's really kind of like, before you try and start something, just make sure you're 100% um, comprehending why you're doing it, what's the purpose of it. Yeah. And if you know that then, and, and you make sure that that's your top line, everything ladders up to that one belief, mm. then fucking apply hard work, go out there, use content, create content, use social, do all that, do all those things. And be able to like, stomach the nose yeah. and, like, and the difficulties don't, and don't uh, what I've learned from that is don't take it personally it's all yeah. part, and par yeah. part and parcel of business and totally. it's uh, it's a bit like for me it's a bit weird but a bit like boxing mm. you never expect to get into a boxing ring and think you're just going to throw the punches right, occasionally right. you're yeah. going to get a smash on the face yeah. totally and yeah. rather than lose your call cool and windmill back out just stay methodical stay mm -hmm. to your core beliefs and your strategy yeah. and come back out totally, yeah. and, and it's yeah. the same yeah. as that yeah. um, so. if you were to recap on our interview this is second to last question um, how would you title this interview oh dog interrupts <laughs> <laughs> rudely interrupts my clients <laughs> stealing the show <laughs> the, the it should just be called Rafa yeah. his name is Rafa Rafa Benitez I think I'll follow him yeah. <laughs> yeah. on Instagram yeah. I do um how would you title it? Um, I think they just introduced this question recently. This is a good yeah. one. Yes, it is a good one. Yeah. How would you title it? Uh, this is going to be cemented in history as well, bearing in mind. Lads. Lads. So, <laughs> lads talk about lad stuff. 
Lads and a dog. Um, <laughs> three lads and a dog. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is this the first time you had a dog on the podcast? Actually, we had, when I interviewed the Olympian, Comrade, we had a short moment where a dog kind of came yeah. on. Yeah. But it wasn't, it was a random owner's. Okay. It just ran over to us. Yeah. It, was out, it was in Crystal Palace Park interviewing after training. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, he lit, I mean, he, he does run this space. Now. <laughs> yeah. He's been here since <laughs> 12 weeks old. And it's nice, it's actually great. I, and it, again, ladders up to that belief of why we're doing it, make things more human. Yeah. Like when you're in a gallery and you see a dog, it does, it's an icebreaker and it makes you feel more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, not necessarily the same case when you're doing an interview, but. <laughs> but um, um, if you want me to uh, come up with the title, I can. Or oh, if, you've got, an, if um, you've got anything, then. Uh, how do you title this interview? Uh, just could call it Unit London if you want. <laughs> just. Um, I mean, everything that's popping into my head is just like so cliched, so. I know, same. Um, <laughs> Art, business, and fun. And dogs. And dogs. <laughs> Art, business, and dogs, yeah, I like that. Art, business, and dogs. Um, <laughs> Pretty much sums it up. <laughs> yeah. My, my, um, my uh, mentor, Rob Moore, he has the destructive entrepreneur, and his catchphrase is, um, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. My catchphrase, mm. a bit cheesy, but I believe in be happy, never content. So if I were to say to you guys, what does be happy, never content, what's your interpretation of that? That's the last question. That's a great, I think that's, that's actually good. a great yeah. thing to, to live by um, because it's like not getting too carried away with the successes um, and never resting on your laurels. Because I mean, it's very easy and we see this a lot and I think it's a sign, a lot of the time I think it's a sign of immaturity and an experience maybe, but something goes really well. You make, you, you make a great sale, you do a great deal. Um, it's so easy to get carried away with that and then go out and party or go out and think that you've made it and whatever. But actually that's the biggest pitfall because you're only as good as your last deal a lot of the time. Mm. And so we've learned, I mean, we've never, we've never really celebrated a huge deal because we're so aware of the overheads and- It's all reinvestment anyway. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it is. Exactly. You it might is. get a no, hundred grand deal win or 200 grand deal win, but then yeah. ultimately most of it, people think as well, when they look at entrepreneurs, oh, they're million pound or boxer. They've just got a million pounds for a fight. Well, yeah. when you take out the trainer, nutritionist, exactly. sports therapist, the overheads, taxes, yeah. you know, the travel, before yeah. you know it, it's not actually a lot. And then yeah. they've got to reinvest it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's a nice nod to, to the ambition as well, never being content with what you have. Yeah. Um, being, being proud of it, being happy yeah. with it is one thing. And that's, that is great and that's important. Gratification of it. S yeah. Super important. Because if you're not happy with it, then you're probably doing the wrong thing. But, but, never be kind of satisfied with it. I think that's an important, I think most yeah. entrepreneurs like embrace that mindset. Um, Cause we're certainly, when we make a big sale and we do a big week or we do we sell out a show, then we're thinking about what's next. How do we build upon that? Yeah. You know, um, and that's, that's the mentality that I think a leader has to have. Cause if, if we're not thinking like that, then what have our team got to, to aspire to and look forward to, mm. you know? So um, I think that's a great, that's a great motto. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I like it. I think. For us, I think content is like being safe, you know? It's mm. like, if we're not moving forward, that's probably what makes us unhappy. Mm. If we're not moving forward or if we're not doing, because we're such ambitious and we're doers, you know? It's like we want, we constantly need to be doing something or aiming for a goal or like the next big thing. It's like, as Joe said, this is Mayfair now is, was, was like almost like, couldn't even fathom that three years ago. But now it's like normalized for us. It's like, well, now it's like, we, we've got to get an overseas gallery, you know? So it's like, if we're not constantly moving forward and, and progressing and advancing and aspiring to something, then I think that we'd be unhappy. What makes us happy is, is working for something and, like, and, and it paying off and then trusting that hard work, um, you're going to get the fruits, you know, of your labors ultimately. Yeah. Mm. Without sounding cliche, but I, think, but I think that's what makes us happy. It's, it's purpose. It's it? purpose. It's purpose and determination, and, and working for something that, that you truly believe in. Yeah. Um, and and working for something that on a bigger scale is going to make a difference, hopefully, Wicked. in the industry. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for your time, guys. This is the like I said off air. This is the first time we've interviewed two two people at the yeah. same time, which is mm. and three three people. Like three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, which, which is epic. Yeah. I want to say shout out to Mimbosa for capturing everything. So thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's, that's a wrap, guys. So Pleasure, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. And, uh, you've thank been you. two of the nicest people ever. Honestly, oh, and I'm not just saying man. that you're fucking decent guys. Oh, nice one, mate. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank Appreciate you. it. Likewise. If we can get a couple of photos and then we're done. Yeah, sweet, brilliant. And maybe with uh, Rafa. <laughs> I think Rafa's got to be in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, he's definitely like panting down the microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>